Hello again. In this class we've talked about a number by now of agrarian empires or agrarian states and today we will meet the most impressive of all of them at least so far in terms of uh, size, scale, uh, cultural uh, advancement, sophistication, etc. Uh, and uh, witness the unification of China uh, a seminal event in world history since China has remained a powerful force in the world ever since. This uh, came about, uh, this uh, time period in China, uh, its first unification during what's sometimes referred to as the Axial Age, uh, which means sort of the, a pivotal period uh, in world history. The Axial Age here coincides uh, with some of the great achievements in philosophy and politics in ancient Greece, which we'll get to. So a lot of different things happening around the world uh, in the Axial Age of great importance. So Chinese unification fits uh, right in there. Uh, as uh, one of the authors I've taken to quoting uh, in the last few uh, units says, China's long history has been marked by three great revolutions that fundamentally changed its political and social structure. The first, in 221 BC, ended the feudal system and created a centralized empire. And that's what we're talking about here in the unification of China. So ending the feudal system is another way to say that before this, uh, for hundreds of years, uh, China was uh, decentralized. There wasn't uh, an emperor in control of the whole uh, kingdom. Uh, uh, there were a number of uh, medium to small size states that all competed with each other, but there was no overarching emperor controlling the whole land. Uh, we'll get to uh, a little bit more on that in a while. We're going to start by looking at uh, some of the thought of this era. Uh, and it does make sense that uh, this uh, axial age on the other side, the uh, near side uh, of hundreds of years of decentralized power, which usually means and did in this case political turmoil, violence, uh, bloodshed, lots of warfare, uh, that uh, there would be a ferment of uh, social, po political, philosophical thought uh, because uh, often in troubled times, people are trying to work things out to figure out a way to bring back stability and harmony, ask questions about what's the best way to organize a society, uh, ask uh, you know some of the most important fundamental philosophical metaphysical questions, and here in this era in China, we really have three uh, schools of thought or philosophies competing with each other, and they're all quite different, though there are some similarities too. The first one uh, is the most famous, uh, uh, Confucianism, you see here, uh, coming from Confucius himself. Uh, and then we'll get to, uh, those are some of his disciples, Taoism, uh, the second of the three uh, influential uh, philosophical systems. Uh, ways of thinking, uh, again, quite different in many ways, uh, and then to legalism, which is very different than the other two, uh, although it has a few similarities as well. In some ways, these are all competing with each other, but since there's overlap and they're not always talking about the same subjects, sometimes it's like comparing apples to oranges. But these are the three big uh, uh, philosophies uh, of the day. So we'll start with the most famous uh, of them and the most famous individual, maybe the most famous individual in all of Chinese history, the great uh, philosopher, uh, political theorist, uh, and political uh, operator to some degree as well, Confucius. Confucius uh, was around during uh, uh, the period when China was divided into lots of states and went around offering his services as a political uh, uh, figure. Uh, in one state after another, and he got a number of minor or mid-level positions, but never achieved the kind of power that he uh, you know, wanted to. Uh, maybe it's fortunate for the world because this happens a lot in history. Uh, he ended up having more time, of course, to ponder politics uh, and society, culture, uh, and uh, uh, then gave himself over to uh, thinking uh, and teaching uh, what he thought uh, were the proper principles for a successful uh, society and culture. Uh, as 
the textbook, our textbook author says, Confucius's thought was fundamentally moral, ethical, and political in character. He was also thoroughly practical. Confucius did not address abstruse philosophical questions because he thought they would not help to solve the political and social problems of his day. So Confucianism, which is sometimes thought of as a religion as well as philosophy, uh, it, if it is a religion, uh, it's not one that deals with the typical questions about life and death. That's what he means by metaphysical questions. And questions like, does life have meaning or what's the meaning of life? Uh, his philosophy is much more grounded in everyday experience and trying to uh, think about uh, and lay down principles for the best way to live life as an individual uh, and the best way for our society to be organized. So it's a moral, political, practical philosophy uh, which had gigantic historical impact, partly, mainly why Confucius is still talked about today uh, because uh, his, uh, his thought, the educational program that stems from his thought, uh, uh, held sway in China for hundreds of years. And as I said, Confucianism as a philosophy slash religion is still around today uh, in East Asia. So uh, he's arguably one of the top, I don't know, three or five most influential figures in all of world history. All of world history over all time. Uh, he is right there near the, near the top. Uh, so uh, he laid down principles uh, uh, over uh, the years, uh, and the body of thought uh, that he's known for was carried on by disciples after him, uh, as we'll see, and people who wrote down uh, things that he said uh, during his own lifetime. But uh, he had principles uh, for individuals to live uh, uh, ethically, morally. Uh, he wanted to bring about harmony, uh, uh, and as many philosophers do, uh, through respect for the state, he did believe strongly in that, uh, but certainly also respect uh, for the family, uh, prince, the principle of uh, xiao, uh, uh, filial piety, which means uh, reverence for the family, and a lot of the religion uh, here uh, is based around respect for the family, which we have already seen goes back and predates Confucius, goes back to some of the first uh, uh, dynasties that we looked at in an, uh, the last unit, actually. So, uh, his school of thought uh, uh, is largely known to us uh, through the Analects, as they're known, and, and this is a body of writings that come, as far as we know, from his actual uh, words and uh, uh, you know, thoughts, uh, but uh, were written down by students, disciples, etc., uh, he did reject, again, metaphysics and religion in the traditional sense, as just noted above. Uh, his focus was on uh, training superior individuals. Uh, and uh, so he developed uh, what became an educational system, already was so in his time, but he was uh, mostly interested in, in training, giving the equivalent of a college education to uh, talented uh young men that were going to become administrators, bureaucrats, civil servants in the government. Uh, again, he's above, as in his principles for ethical living, he believed in respect for uh, a state, the government, and respect for uh, family and filial piety. But if you're going to respect the state highly uh, as one of your major principles, it's likely you're going to focus uh, attention and thought on uh, what you know, brings about good or better government. He believed that uh, training, you know, having highly educated civil servants uh, uh, was crucial uh, in that regard. So his influence on education uh, centuries later in later dynasties uh, is came about when the principles for education that he laid down at the time of his life for a handful of hand-picked and gifted uh, students uh, was later sort of a more widespread education uh, for uh, Chinese uh, people in general, not necessarily just those that are going into government service. Uh, he believed in studying the book, uh, uh, songs, uh, book of songs, uh, book of history, book of uh, rights, uh, the four books we talked about before that went back to the Zhou Dynasty. So uh, 
the basis of China's educational system then for hundreds of years uh, went through Confucius, but Confucius essentially forced everyone to go back to uh, the Book of Songs and use that as a centerpiece of education, which is to say then that the core uh, of his educational philosophy and the core then of Chinese educational philosophy was studying the classics and studying literature, poetry. Uh, and th this sounds strange to us uh, in, in modern day, in the 21st century, but we'll uh, see it in other parts of the world as well. Uh, in Europe, uh, they uh, largely do the same thing, uh, not, not now, today, as much, much, but for a long time, say in Great Britain or England, uh, the English upper classes that went to Oxford or Cambridge uh, that were being trained for government service to become high-ranking uh, administrators or advisors uh, in the state, their education was almost a purely literary one. There weren't social sciences in those days. This is really kind of more in the realm of the humanities. Uh, so it would make sense that in government uh, and uh, right, uh, you're dealing with different institutions, political, economic, social, cultural, uh, as a political leader, bureaucrat, civil servant, advisor. Uh, so uh, having in your educational background degrees or the equivalent thereof uh, in the literary classics of your culture uh, is a way to understand human psychology, understand how uh, people, uh, makes people tick, uh, uh, makes sort of groups, uh, uh, you know, uh, operate the way they do, act the way they do. So a literary education uh, was actually much more practical than it may sound, uh, at, at least given what the, the options that were around at the time. Getting to the core of Confucius's thought, and we're just scratching the surface here today, of course, uh, but uh, he believed uh, in a number of principles uh, along with uh, filial piety, filial piety, or uh, shao. Uh, also, uh, the concept of ren, uh, which basically meant kindness or benevolence, and honesty, uh, and li, uh, uh, order, uh, a properly uh, a proper conduct, uh, prescribed traditional conduct, uh, etc. Et uh, and he b b believed that focusing on all these things. Uh, as uh, I say at the bottom of the screen, will produce loyal, disciplined, diligent, respectful, and courteous leaders. Uh, and these things uh, he also believed then were the key to order and stability in society. So Confucius is laying down, and that was his more specific goal, an educational system for civil servants, though he did believe that was crucial to the flourishing of the state and the flourishing of society, but the principles he certainly uh, believed uh, could and should be broadened out uh, so that uh, if everybody from the government uh, and its leaders on down to the average peasant farmer and everyone in between has these as their major principles, filial piety, uh, right, uh, certain uh, benevolence, kindness, generosity, uh, the ran, uh, and to uh, uh, order, uh, proper conduct, behaving in a proper way in the, in the right setting, uh, manners, etc., uh, respect for others, uh, then you have harmony, and you'll bring harmony in society. Uh, so uh, this is the core uh, of Confucius's thought. Uh, he said, the gentleman understands what is moral, the small man understands what is profitable. So um, the ancient Chinese uh, did not put, uh, and we saw this in our last unit, did not put merchants and traders, business people at the top of the social ladder as uh, we tend to in our society and Western societies today. He did have many followers, uh, and uh, one of the two most famous is this guy, Mencius, uh, a spokesman uh, for Confucian thought. Uh, also, like Confucius before him, uh, a political advisor to uh, kings uh, and uh, you know, high-ranking political leaders, uh, but not of overwhelming success. So he shared uh, that background uh, with uh, his mentor, uh, or at least uh, a precursor uh, in, in Confucius. But he did have political experience. He wasn't just a philosopher or theorist. Uh, the experience served him well. 
uh, in uh, laying down his own version of Confucian thought. So keep in mind Mencius and the guy we're going to look at next, uh, uh, Shun Tzu, uh, both disciples uh, of Confucius, uh, but they're both still kind of within the, uh, uh, you know, uh, under the umbrella of what's called or considered today Confucian philosophy. Uh, and we'll see quite a simple bracing contrast between uh, Mencius uh, and uh, the next guy, Shun Tzu. Uh, so uh, the, at, at the simplest level, uh, Mencius believed that human nature uh, was basically good uh, and uh, that with the proper education, then uh, at least those uh, you know handful of elites that get educated, have access to education, will bring enlightened rule. Uh, so his, his emphasis is on the Ren uh, in Confucian philosophy. So uh, if we go back, uh, just to refresh us already, uh, right? Benevolence, kindness, integrity, honesty, uh, fairness, uh, these kind of things. And he believed it, it, it came pretty naturally to human beings, so you don't have to work too hard. Uh, uh, to make this happen. You don't have to beat it uh, into people. You don't have to punish them uh, or force uh, feed this to them. It, it, it will come. Uh, virtually uh, anyone uh, uh, can become uh, uh, sort of enlightened uh, in, in, in this way. Uh, and uh, uh, we see it uh, uh, that this is optimistic, maybe naively optimistic, uh, uh, so, some might say. Uh, and some did say. Uh, so uh, our author, Bentley, uh, says his policies would rarely succeed in the real world where human interests, wills, and ambitions constantly clash. Over the long term, his ideas deeply influenced the Confucian tradition, however. I chopped that quote up a little bit. The first part of it is his critics saying that his policies would rarely succeed and that they were naively optimistic. Uh, that's not necessarily our author uh, uh, saying uh, the, 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 sa the same thing. Uh, so the uh, concept of uh, Shun uh is the idea of an exemplary uh, individual. So virtually anybody uh, in Mencius' uh, mind, uh, with I'm sure some exceptions, could become uh, a, a Shun Tzu because, uh, again, of the natural goodness uh, in human nature. The thought and, and career uh, of Shun Tzu, uh, another disciple, follower of Confucius, shows that there's a lot of different interpre interpretations of Confucian thought possible, because this guy uh, believed that human nature was basically selfish, and so uh, the, it was a critique in many ways, of Mencius's, uh, uh thought. Uh, but he also, like the other two, uh, had political experience as an administrator, fairly high rank, uh, and so this gave him a practical uh, understanding of politics and society, as well as uh, you know a theoretical uh, underpinning uh, and gifts uh, of uh, philosophical thought. Uh, but uh, he believed that because human nature was selfish, that strong social discipline was necessary uh, uh, for order and stability. He emphasized the Li uh, more than the Ren, uh, right? Uh, although Confucius, by emphasizing order and stability, wasn't uh, taking it as far uh, in terms of harshness uh, as this guy. Right? Order and stability can uh, be thought of as uh, um, good-hearted things and can be carried out, at least theoretically, in ways that aren't, you know, bloody and violent. But uh, uh, Shun Tzu uh, uh, thought differently. Uh, he thought harsh punishments on transgressors, whether they be criminals or, uh, you know, political dissidents, uh, was necessary. Uh, he went so far as to, you know, believe and say that human nature is evil, uh, and that goodness is caused by an intentional activity uh, only. Uh, so because he had uh, some real reservations about uh, human nature uh, being selfish, he believed that government needed to be tougher and rougher. Uh, whereas Mencius, who had a much more optimistic view of what human beings were capable of, didn't uh, see the need for the uh, rulers, a government, to lean heavily on, on, on people. Uh, so, uh, 
reading from a, a book, a great book on the world's religions called God is Not One, uh, of fairly recent origin. Uh, the author, Stephen Prothero, says he that uh, Shun Tzu uh, uh, rejected what he saw as Mencius's naive optimism uh, about human nature. Um, Shun Tzu argued that human beings are basically wicked, uh, grasping, hungry, egotistical uh, uh, bastards. Uh, Confucius had believed that shame worked better than punishment. Uh, uh, Shun Tzu disagreed. Uh, in this world of greed and envy and hate, our wickedness, wickedness needs to be beaten out of us. Education doesn't cultivate our nature, it changes it. Uh, only through strict laws and severe punishments can humans learn to subdue their private passions in service of the public good, as well as their own. So whereas Mencius used gentle, botanical metaphors of nurture uh, and growth, uh, botanical, uh, you know, uh, describing our education uh, to uh, to the human heartedness already planted within us. So he's saying we're human hearted anyway, and his language shows it. So it uses, uh, again, sort of uh, nature, uh, language of the you know, growth of plants and things like this. Uh, but Shun Tzu uh, uh, relied on harder metaphors, the workshop, metal shaped by hammering into a sword, wood bent by steam into a bow, to describe uh, uh, the example of uh, Shun Tzu, uh, uh, the exemplary, uh, individual, uh, how he could emerge uh, out of something so unvirtuous. So just the very uh, uh, language that they used uh, shows a difference in uh, attitude, uh, a difference in their their beliefs uh, in really human nature. So there's a lot, a lot of thought uh, given here about human nature, the nature of what it is to be human. Uh, and this is uh, consistent with other uh, places around the world during the Axial Age. I mentioned ancient Greece, so I'll use that as my you know uh, go-to example again. But uh, Socrates, uh, Plato, uh, Aristotle, who we'll meet soon enough, uh, were doing much the same thing uh, at around the at around the same time. Taoism. Uh, this uh, is quite interesting, uh, and the Tao Te Ching uh, or the Way. Uh, so this. Uh, is totally different. Uh, I shouldn't say totally because I said there were a few similarities, but it, overall it's uh, wildly different from either Confucian uh, philosophy, Confucianism that we just looked at, or legalism that comes uh, after. The way, uh, sometimes thought of as a path or a road, it's not so much a church uh, a search for truth or wisdom uh, or knowledge, uh, but about sort of uh, where to go, where, where should we go? Not necessarily liter literally, uh, but metaphor metaphorically and figuratively. The uh, Taoist principles uh, were, uh, as has been said, sort of allergic to doctrine. So this wasn't a religion uh, that was uh, an adhering to a doctrine like the Christians or the Jews or the Muslims uh, uh, would, uh, you know, and we'll see uh, in their own time and place. So they, they didn't really like doctrine. This was in a, basically about adhering to certain written uh, texts and rules. They believed there was a natural way uh, uh, to do things uh, that kind of just uh, came uh, came, uh, came naturally to human beings. It's kind of, in many ways, a go with the flow type of religion, uh, and uh, you know, kind of. Uh, in, I hate to use this analogy or push it too far, but uh, it's kind of like a, a hippie uh, 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 philosophy. Uh, it's not so much a social philosophy, though. Uh, it's more about how it's sort of natural for human beings to kind of find their path, find their road, uh, wh where to go for it for yourself. Free and easy wandering is a principle that comes up a lot. Uh, and they meant that uh, both uh, wandering of the mind uh, and wandering of the body, so traveling and a, a place where you can kind of see them uh, fitting kind of the counterculture or being somewhat similar to the counterculture of our country in the 1960s, balancing our yin and yang, uh, sort of these opposite principles, but ones that uh, are supposed to you know, eventually kind of not just balance, but uh, sort of coexist and meld together uh, in some ways. Sitting and forgetting, another principle uh, that uh, comes up a lot. 
So the, uh, the Taoist belief system is not really about deep thought uh, and contemplation uh, for the sake of gaining knowledge uh, other than maybe self-knowledge, uh, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it's much more laid back. They weren't wild about too much structure, uh, uh, too much uh, you know, law and order and discipline in the way that we saw Confucius was. Uh, so, the uh, Lao Xi, uh, often seen as the founder uh, of the way, we're not even sure he was a real person. He could have been mythical. We've seen that a lot in this class. You go back that far uh, around that time period and earlier, 6th century, and sometimes it's not entirely clear. We saw that with the founder of Egypt, Narmer, could have been a real person. Stories about him and Lao Tzu uh, now uh, uh, could be uh, uh, true. Uh, 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 so Lao Tzu might have been uh, a real guy, uh, might not have. Uh, but uh, uh, the Dao Te Ching, uh, classic of the way and its virtue, uh, is one of the two standard sort of most famous texts. Uh, the other one uh, comes from uh, uh, Shuang Tzu, uh, in his compendium of Taoist thought named Shuang Tzu uh, after him. So it's the uh, Dao De Jing uh, and the Shuang Tzu that are the uh, classic uh, works. Not the only ones, but the classic works here. Uh, and to lay down some principles here uh, to get us uh, give us a gist of what this philosophy was all about. And by the way, if this seems uh, confusing, uh, it is. Uh, even scholars that have studied this for years, uh, especially in the West, uh, uh, find it sometimes baffling. Fascinating oftentimes, but still baffling. Uh, so, Taoists often believe that we too easily let life slip away, uh, and that the answer is to live life in the fullest, kind of in the present moment, uh, kind of in the experience. So they are more about the experience than about, you know, sort of... Uh, you know, the here and now experience rather than about planning uh, and thinking about the future and planning for the future. Uh, that to them uh, was uh, letting life slip away uh, and not sort of living it to the fullest. They believed in free wandering, playing of the mind, body, already kind of mentioned, uh, a, a certain amount of purposelessness. Uh, there doesn't have to be purpose to life. There doesn't have to be goals to life which is very much at odds with our American uh, and sort of Western uh, value system today and really for a long time. Uh, what do you mean you don't have goals? Uh, uh, I actually think there's something to this in a positive sense, uh, that the more you attach stringent goals to something, uh, in some ways it seems like you're actually, to me, I won't get into this, but it seems like you're actually less likely to achieve the goal if you're really striving for it than if you don't strive for it, and you, you probably achieve it uh, anyway, at least more likely that way. That's not the only reason, uh, if even the main one, that the Taoists believe in a purposelessness, uh, but uh, they just thought that it's, it's too much... Uh, there's too much energy put towards organizing uh, and sort of thinking about uh, what the goals are, what the point is, uh, when you should just go with the flow. They believed in a life uh, of detached introspection. Uh, so they did believe about in thinking, but mainly in kind of thinking about yourself, thinking about again, uh, you know, your way in life, where you're, where you're, where you're, you know, going, but not so much in the goal-oriented purpose-filled sense, just about sort of what, you know, understanding where, uh, you know, what direction you're heading in and kind of letting letting it gonna go and flow, I'm using the word flow too much. Uh, so intuition, spontaneity, vitality, uh, simplicity, non-conformity. Taoists were great non-conformists. They don't want to go along with the, you know, the, you know, nine to five job and uh, you know, the mainstream values, etc., etc. Not that there were 9 to 5 jobs, but you get my point. Uh, again, believed in uh, experience and sort of uh, the naturalness of experience. Uh, experience uh, more than 
uh, you know, planning it uh, and thinking about it uh, afterwards, writing a book about it, uh, just living to experience life. A great deal of passivity towards the outside world uh, was uh, believed to be uh, one of the approaches to a better life, strength through passivity, uh, change uh, uh, and fluidity. So uh, they see life as fluid and constantly kind of uh, uh, changing and shifting uh, and not in a scary way, but uh, in a good way. You have to, again, uh, uh, sort of uh, roll with it. They weren't uh, 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 opponents of government. Uh, they just didn't really, they weren't that interested in government. Uh, that certainly wasn't uh, at the top of their list. So, but they did have thoughts about it. And they tend to believe in limited government and sort of soft power uh, so that government shouldn't lean on people or communities, uh, uh, societies too heavily. And that it should be sort of basically uh, decentralized government putting a lot uh, in the hands of small, self-sufficient communities. So that's not too surprising given what we've already said uh, about the Taoists before. The yin and the yang, uh, I guess the most famous concept come out of uh, Taoism, uh, as uh, Stephen Prothero again says, opposing yet complementary and interpenetrating principles, with each containing a bit uh, and forever evolving into the other. Taoists seek a harmonious union of the two. So yin and yang are opposites, uh, but uh, it's kind of like a dance back and forth between the opposites that are eventually trying to find a way to settle their differences and come to some sort of harmonious, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming together. The, there is a certain correspondence with Confucianism uh, in Chinese history, uh, so that uh, we'll see eventually uh, the, the two philosophies are certainly not mutually exclusive, and they're combined in some ways. The saying that uh, is sometimes put forth is, Confucians by day, Taoists by night. So in your day, you know, in your day job, you got to be a Confucian because it's more about order and, you know, uh, behaving in the right way and uh, you know, getting somewhere through Confucian practical principles. But at nighttime, you want to come home and kick back uh, and contemplate uh, the world uh, and kind of let uh, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, experience uh, uh, take over, uh, intuition, spontaneity. So Confucians by day, Taoist by night. Doesn't sound too bad. Uh, a Taoist saying, uh, one of uh, the many, uh, is there's nothing in the world more soft and weak than water. Yet for attacking things that are hard and strong, there's nothing that surpasses it, nothing that can take its place. Uh, Taoists uh, had lots of sayings that still exist uh, about sort of uh, their way of looking at the, at, at the world. Uh, and so they tend to kind of look at things... Uh, on, from the other side of the way uh, uh, mainstream uh, society does. So uh, a bowl or a pot, uh, uh, instead of focusing on the, the ceramic uh, you know, pot itself, uh, they tend to focus on the, uh, the hole in the middle of it because it's the hole uh, that uh, uh, and holds, the, holds the water, at least from you know, their perspective. There are many other uh, uh, interesting uh, strands of thought uh, through these kind of stories uh, or examples uh, that give us a sense of how different uh, this uh, brand of, uh, of thinking uh, and religious uh, tradition is. Uh, another uh, saying uh, in governing, I think this comes from uh, uh, Shuang Tzu, uh, uh, in governing me and in serving heaven, there's nothing like moderation. Uh, the greater the number of laws and enactments, the more thieves and robbers. So limited governments believe more power should be in the hands of self-sufficient communities, uh, and they're suspicious of too much uh, government power, uh, especially if it's not moderate, uh, and if it's enacting too many laws to try to control uh, too many people. The, the, this group didn't want to be controlled. Uh, and in some ways, they strike me also as sort of libertarians in a sense, uh, uh, in a more laid-back way, but libertarian. Legalism. Uh, this uh, group, who uh, are not espousing a religion, uh, they're espousing a philosophy, and it's mainly a political philosophy. 
sometimes is referred to, as it says, as the real politique of ancient China. Uh, real politique, a European word, uh, is uh, uh, the meaning of real politique is sort of a hardcore politics. Hardball politics is sometimes called uh, hardcore, uh, uh, you know, a realism is sometimes the word uh, used. So the idea being that politics isn't about ideals and ideologies and principles and philosophies and morality, ethics. Uh, it's about the bottom line, uh, about uh, you know self-interest, uh, not just individual, but a nation, an empire, self-interest. Uh, and it's about power. Uh, you wield power uh, in your own national or self-interest. Uh, legalism, uh, like uh, we saw uh, in the philosophy of uh, uh, Sun Tzu, uh, was pessimistic of human nature, uh, suspicious, believed that all uh, human beings act primarily in their own sort of greedy self-interest. Uh, and to, so they tended to see the other philosophies we've looked at, and, and some we haven't, uh, as sort of silly. Uh, they believed they all missed the point, as Ian Morris says, trying to transcend reality was stupid. Godlike kings had yielded to managerial efficiency-seeking ones, meaning in the legalists and uh, rulers and governments that supported uh, uh, or uh, built their political systems based on legalist principles. And the rest of us should get with the program. The goal was not humaneness, but establishing and maintaining order through coercion. So now, needless to say, some of the legalists, though they may have been uh, doing this just for the fun of being cruel and brutal, uh, most of them, I'm sure, believed that this was cr helping to create a better society. Just we have to lay down law and order, and we have to do it in a tough and sometimes you know brutal way uh, to get to that uh, good society to protect people's uh, you know uh, possessions, protect their uh, homes, families, etc. The legalists expected to harness the, their subjects' energy by means of clear and strict laws. Uh, Professor Bentley and Ziegler tell us, hence the name legalist. They imposed a strict legal regimen that clearly outlined uh, expectations and provided severe punishment swiftly administered for violators. And that's putting it mildly. Uh, legalist philosophy uh, and legal uh, thinking uh, was uh, bloody and violent. The punishments, uh, both corporal and capital punishment, uh, uh, not just that they execute a lot of people, but they did so oftentimes in gruesome fashion. Uh, but this uh, was the recipe really that held on in China, uh, not just in this era, but uh, uh, for uh, centuries thereafter, uh, the recipe for strong, strong uh, state power. Uh, the core uh, thinkers uh, behind legalist theory uh, were all practical statesmen, all realists uh, through their own uh, experiences uh, in a brutal, you know, struggle for survival among politicians uh, and between the competing states uh, in China. So uh, these guys uh, in the kingdom of uh, Qin, uh, the first uh, kingdom to unify by conquering all the others, uh, these guys that were living in that time period and the period of warring states that came before it, uh, had practical lessons in statecraft and uh, you know, uh, political wrangling that stayed with them and certainly show up in their philosophy. Uh, Shang Yang uh, and the Book of Lord Shang, uh, which he uh, laid down his own uh, legalist political uh, contributions. Uh, Han Feizi, uh, his essays on statecraft, another one of the seminal uh, documents, writings uh, from the legalist viewpoint. There was a common denominator of practical ruthlessness uh, in the legalists, uh, as uh, one scholar says, making Machiavelli look like a schoolboy. Machiavelli uh, is the first sort of great practitioner of real politique in Europe, an Italian uh, statesman, also with political experience, turned political theorist, uh, who's famous for, uh, to put it, Quite simply, an ends justify the means policy in politics. If the ends are important enough, uh, valuable enough, any means you use, anything you do to get that 
is justifiable, whether it means lie, cheat, steal, kill, massacre, uh, murder, uh, execute, uh, etc. Et uh, so, uh, but uh, this particular scholar is saying uh, that the legalists uh, make Machiavelli look mild, uh, which may actually be true. Uh, th this is a pretty brutal philosophy if you look into it further than we have time to. Uh, the uh, farmers and soldiers were sort of put above everyone else. Uh, why? Uh, because farmers, uh, the more they are, the more effective, efficient they are, the, the more food they produce. The more food they produce, the more, the more population there is, the greater the population, the larger the armies that you can put together. This was a formula that we already saw in our last unit that earlier Chinese dynasties understood, uh, but it's now being put uh, to even more brutal use uh, in this uh, uh, time period. Uh, the legalists, again, believed in clear and very strict laws. They wanted to harness their subject to state goals, so there wasn't a lot of concern uh, in their political and legal systems uh, in one Chinese, uh, you know, uh, fragment in state after another uh, to individual liberties as we think of them today. Uh, the legalist uh, theory was not about liberty, uh, not about your freedom to do what you want. It's about you doing what you're told uh, because the state believes it's what's best for it. Uh, there was even uh, pressure, uh, and this is sort of fairly consistent in legalist uh, thinking, f uh, to uh, co uh, convince family members to rat out uh, other family members and friends who weren't were being disloyal, or they thought were, or criticizing the government, etc., etc. This has a long shelf life in Chinese history uh, because you could say it either stayed or it comes back with a vengeance later on in the mid-20th century, which we're not going to get to in this class, uh, under the Chinese communists uh, and Mao Zedong. Uh, who uh, did the same thing, uh, got young people, uh, particularly uh, during the uh, uh, Cultural Revolution, 1970s, uh, to uh, turn in their parents uh, for subversive activity. Uh, it, got, it got frightening uh, how, uh, how uh, brutal all of that was. Uh, so legalism's uh, short and long-term uh, influence on China uh, was great. Uh, and it did sort of help to lead to the unification that we're in the midst of talking about here. The two uh, theorists that we mentioned before uh, of legalism, Shang Yang uh, and Han Fei Zi, uh, a little more uh, on them. Uh, as uh, uh, one source says, uh, for Lord Shang, uh, legalism's guiding light meaning he was guiding light, the goal was the enrichment of the state and the strengthening of its military capacity. Do not do unto others as you would have them do unto you, said Lord Shang, because if in enterprises uh, you undertake what the enemy would be ashamed to do, then you have the advantage. Uh, neither be good uh, nor do good, because a state that uses the wicked to govern the good always enjoys, enjoys order and becomes strong. So now you see uh, a, a little bit further uh, how uh, rough and tumble uh, and cruel uh, this uh, political philosophy can be. Of course, uh, these uh, people are living uh, in a very competitive, very uh, dangerous, uh, uh, you know, a time period uh, and place. Uh, you know, in uh, sort of the period of warring states in China. So that certainly had an impact on the way they thought about the uh, world that they were living in. You see something similar in Europe uh, later on uh, with the amount of uh, uh, danger that was around uh, within countries and you know, foreign invasion. Uh, you see sort of similarly uh, it look like kind of bloodthirsty uh, political philosophies. Uh, he thought uh, comprehensive law codes uh, needed to be brought up, uh, uh, drawn up uh, with uh, you know, vicious penalties, beheading, burying alive. Hard people convicted to hard labor for life in some cases, uh, and they should be imposed rigidly on, on uh, anyone uh, who strayed from the law, uh, you know, uh, even uh, you know, in a relatively minor way. Uh, they liked to say uh, the uh, 
legalists that laws force messy materials to conform. Uh, messy materials to conform. Uh, Han Feizi, uh, in his own uh, collected essays, uh, uh, talks about uh, when the sage, I mean, kind of the wise man, rules the state, he does not count on people doing uh, good of themselves, but employs such measures as will keep them from doing any evil. The intelligent ruler upholds solid facts and discards useless frills. He does not speak about the deeds of humanity and righteousness, and he does not listen to the words of learned men. Meaning he doesn't listen to uh, philosophers, he doesn't listen to uh, professors and intellectuals. Uh, he's uh, too uh, concerned with sort of the everyday uh, difficulties uh, and uh, hard-headed realities of, you know, politics. The period of warring states uh, came uh, at the end uh, of the Zhou dynasty uh, and lasted for uh, a number of centuries. China divided into seven uh, kingdoms. You kind of see a little bit in that blurry map on the left there. Uh, and it's on the other side of that that we see the unification uh, of China uh, with one of the states, uh, uh, the Qin kingdom, uh, uh, conquering the others. Uh, so uh, by the 5th century uh, uh, BCE, territorial princes uh, ignored the central government and used their resources to build, strengthen, and expand their states. The textbook tells us they fought ferociously with one another in hopes of establishing themselves as leaders of a new political order. Uh, in a way, the political turmoil helps explain the cultural creativity of the late Zhou dynasty and the period of the Roaring States because it forced thoughtful people to reflect on the nature of society and the proper roles of human beings in society. Some sought to identify principles that would restore political and social order. Others conquered themselves, uh, or concerned themselves, conquered themselves would be interesting, uh, concerned themselves with a search for individual tranquility apart from society. So this is a, a quote that I forgot was here, because I said it already in my own words at the beginning, uh, that during these kind of times of turmoil, you often uh, see uh, a real ferment of uh, creative thought about how societies uh, could and should be organized. So the unification uh, of the kingdom of uh, uh, Qin, or, or China, uh, uh, through the kingdom of Qin. Uh, and this happens quite a bit in world history, where uh, what we call the unification of a country isn't uh, about the people getting together and say, hey, let's all sort of become one. Uh, it tends to happen where the strongest of a number of states, uh, you know, people have similar culture, uh, uh, cultural attributes living in separate states will take it upon itself to conquer the other weaker ones and force them into a unified kingdom. Happens uh, much later in history in Italy, uh, happens much later uh, in, uh, in the 19th century in Germany, uh, and a few other places as well. Uh, so the state of Qin uh, during this period of warring states for a time had been you know, uh, competing with many others, uh, but uh, eventually got the upper hand. Uh, and eventually Han was conquered, uh, Shao conquered, uh, uh, Wei conquered, uh, and on and on and on and on. Uh, so, uh, and the little uh, map there lighting up in red shows you the order in which it came. Uh, Ian Morrison, uh, his great book, Why the West Rules for Now, uh, says uh, the Qin uh, dynasty and Rome... Roman Empire had a lot, a Roman Republic, I guess, at that time, uh, had a lot in common. Each was a spectacular example of the advantages of backwardness, combining organizational methods pioneered in an older core uh, uh, with military methods honed on a violent frontier. Uh, each slaughtered, enslaved, and dispossessed millions, and each drove social development up faster than ever before. Chin and Rome also exemplify what we might call the paradox of violence. When the rivers of blood dried, their imperialism left most people in both East and West better off, uh, which is a controversial thing to say, but there's a great deal of evidence behind uh, this idea. Not that that uh, uh, makes it uh, justifiable uh, in the end, and Ian Morris, I don't believe, is saying that, uh, he's sort of staying agnostic or neutral uh, on whether that's good or bad. Uh, overall, uh, was the bloodshed, you know, was the uh, 
the better off nature of society in the East and the West, uh, you know, on this side of the violence, uh, worth all of the violence, that's unclear. He's just saying matter-of-factly that if you look at it, uh, even if it's not justified and if we had to do it over again, we wouldn't and shouldn't, uh, on this side, uh, people uh, were better off. Uh, not, and that's, you know, usually not in the same generation as when the conquests and the bloodshed took place, uh, but much later on. Uh, going on to say that uh, Qin, uh, the ferocious state at the western edge of the eastern, western edge of the eastern core, uh, uh, has the same customs as the barbarians, uh, says the, or said the anonymous author of the Stratagems of the Warring States, as it was called. It has the heart of a tiger or wolf, greedy, loving profit, and untrustworthy, knowing nothing of ritual, duty, or virtuous conduct. Yet despite being the antithesis of everything Confucian gentlemen held dear, Qin exploded to conquer China in the 3rd century BCE. So uh, even at the time, uh, many of its adversaries uh, and those uh, who you know, criticized it uh, did recognize that this was an up-and-coming fierce uh, power, and it's its fierceness that allowed it to unify China. The very first then emperor of a centralized China, uh, who had been the, the king uh, of the uh, smaller Qin state that conquered everybody else, uh, Qin uh, uh, Shi Huangdi, uh, is a legendary figure uh, in uh, not just Chinese but world history. Uh, but uh, this laid down the, uh, the foundations of authoritarian centralized rule uh, in the Chinese empire for centuries to come. They, they, China has such a confusing uh, history. There are more moments like the period of Warring States that we briefly talked about, where the rule from the center, imperial centralized rule, breaks down, uh, but it always comes back uh, as it's back, uh, you know, today. So uh, the reign of uh, uh, the Qin uh, dynasty, which wasn't very long, uh, uh, this dynasty didn't last very long, but. Uh, what it is, what it achieved and established, even if it went away for short amounts of time, uh, ended up coming back. So the foundations that were laid were never entirely uh, uprooted. In fact, they they they, they were you know in place and more often influential. Uh, if when they were gone, it was that they were gone only temporarily. Uh, but under uh, uh, Xi Huangdi, uh, again one of the most important figures in Chinese history. The, an established centralized bureaucracy uh, uh, used by dynasty after dynasty after dynasty was uh, laid down. We'll see the educational uh, system, uh, the bureaucracy administration, uh, at least its basics were laid down. Uh, uh, under uh, uh, Qin Shi Huangdi, uh, standardized law, uh, standardized currency, weights and measures, all important uh, elements of uh, organizing a state so it becomes efficient, effective, uh, and uh, you know can stand the test of time as well as even produce positives for its uh, citizens or subjects. Different spoken languages uh, uh, because China uh, already then was a gigantic uh, place, different uh, language uh, uh, you know variations uh, you know uh, that were quite variant. Uh, but uh, he uh, and his court established a, a go government established a common script. So uh, one common language kind of becoming like an early national language uh, may have been the first uh, empire, uh, at least a, a large one, to, to do such a thing. Um, many subjects uh, actually must have liked the stability imposed. Th th this is uh, a centralized government, uh, an authoritarian monarch or emperor that's basing his, uh, you know, if there's any theory behind it at all, it's legalist theory. And we know uh, that legalist theory is not always too pleasant. But many subjects, uh, I think, probably liked this. Maybe even the majority. Not if they were on the, uh, you know, the, the other end uh, of the law, the wrong end of the law. But if they were not, they were probably happy uh, that uh, this government, though it wasn't interested in your rights uh, as a subject, uh, there was no such concept at all. Uh, but it did provide law and order, which protected your property and your family, uh, you know, relatively well enough. Where it's like, okay, this I'll, I'll support this. Um, uh, Shi Huangdi uh, disarmed 
uh, nobles or ignore the nobles and appointed governors uh, in uh, various regions of the country uh, where certain this noble or that noble is used to uh, you know, uh, wielding power and he just sort of uh, went around them or sort of went over them which caused uh, certainly anger uh, and animosity uh, but this is always what happens uh, for a king and emperor to centralize power effectively he's going to have to find a way to bring uh, the nobles to heal uh, sometimes it can be done by making deals with them sometimes it can be done by force or threats of force but one way or the other you have to find a way uh, to emasculate the nobles uh, and uh, China's first emperor here does so uh, he's also known for building roads and imposing military drafts. Millions of people drafted to build uh, bridges, palaces, irrigation systems, uh, roads, walls, including uh, a, a big section, early section of the Great Wall of China. Uh, there was an authoritarian crackdown on dissent, so this was no democracy. This is a top-down uh, uh, government, uh, one person snaps their fingers and everybody else jumps. Something like we saw in ancient Egypt. So this guy, he's even more power. He's ruling over a much uh, wealthier and more powerful kingdom. Uh, so Confucians, Taoists, other uh, uh, groups uh, were subversives uh, in the sense they launched uh, campaigns of criticism against the regime, uh, which didn't go over very well. Uh, uh, Shi Huangdi is famous uh, for the burning of the books, as known, which was exactly that. All books uh, uh, that they could find were rounded up in the kingdom uh, uh, and burned, except ones on medicine, fortune telling, and farming. And there was one volume, I think, on uh, uh, the official Qin uh, uh, dynasty's history. Again, the Qin dynasty is the uh, one that conquered uh, uh, China and established this unified kingdom. And those books, then, what they had in common was that they were all seen as having some practical value. Fortune-telling in those days, really all over the world, uh, was seen as uh, having practical value. Uh, but works of literature and history, uh, all kinds of cultural, uh, artistic treasures were burned. So this guy uh, uh, wasn't too into high culture, I think we can say, uh, pretty safely. Uh, he buried 460 critical scholars alive, so wasn't all that interested in scientific inquiry apparently either, uh, and uh, wasn't uh, uh, wasn't too fond of intellectuals. Uh, it, it seems uh, I know how he feels, uh, although I, I think that's going uh, quite too far. Uh, no open discussion of philosophy or literature uh, was allowed from that point forward. So this was not. Uh, a kingdom uh, that was uh, going to allow free play uh, of thought uh, and uh, intellectual freedom, uh, uh, this kind of thing. This, this was a closed down society uh, where uh, any kind of dissent, any kind of creative uh, uh, you know, view, if it was outside the norm, was going to be punished. Right? Burying 460 scholars alive. Uh, is sending uh, uh, quite a, a message. Uh, I'm sure it had the desired effect in uh, uh, quieting uh, those uh, scholars that didn't uh, uh, get uh, buried alive. Uh, there were eventually, you won't be surprised to hear, revolts against the dynasty. Uh, many were angry at the forced work away from home. Average people who were the ones usually poor people, usually forced into these work uh, camps or drafts to build roads and uh, the Great Wall of China, etc. Uh, from 207 BC, uh, the dynasty started to collapse uh, amidst growing political chaos uh, and eventually did uh, uh, collapse. Uh, although Sri Sh Hangdi uh, did die, uh, he wasn't killed or forced out of office. Uh, and to show uh, uh, how powerful and wealthy this guy was uh, and uh, how wealthy his kingdom was, uh, his uh, tomb uh, contained tens of thousands of terracotta soldiers, which we saw in the opening slide, and we'll see again uh, coming up. The Great Wall, uh, maybe what uh, most Americans know most about China today, uh, certainly one of the great uh, 
building engineering projects in all of world history uh, wasn't done, as you might have already uh, figured, in one reign, in one in, uh, in one dynasty. So the various lines you see there of different colors, uh, if you look at the bottom carefully, squint your eyes, because uh, you can barely see it, uh, but uh, you can see which dynasty contributed to what part of the wall or walls. So some of this had already been laid down. Uh, a small part of it was done uh, during this, the uh, Qin Dynasty, and only a small part because the Qin Dynasty didn't last for very long. Uh, but the next dynasty, the Han, uh, uh, the, in orange, uh, built a great deal of the wall. But uh, uh, though the wall is certainly uh, important in its own right, uh, and uh, this, of course, was a defensive barrier built for military purposes, strategic purposes, uh, to defend primarily against the, the nomads uh, from the north and the northwest, uh, Mongolia, as you see on the map there as well. Uh, but I'm mainly using the wall, as it says at the top of the screen, as a symbol of growing Chinese power. Uh, so James McClellan, uh, in a really good book called Science and Technology in World History, uh, writes, China was first unified in 221 BC. An unprecedented authority uh, became centralized in the emperor, backed uh, administratively by an elaborate and formidable bureaucracy associated with royal courts. The population of China under the control of the emperor has been estimated at 60 million. That, that's a lot, by the way, for that day. I forget what the, the world population was, but that's a big chunk of the world's population right there. Uh, 60 million at the beginning of the Christian era. The early Chinese state built granaries and maintained standing armies. Sophisticated bronze metallurgy was also in practice uh, uh, with the bronze uh, tripod, uh, the symbol of administrative power invested in officials. As for monumental building, in addition to hydraulic works, the Great Wall of China has been hailed as the largest building project in history. Construction of the first 1,250 miles of the Great Wall on the divide between the steppe and arable land, meaning between the nomads and uh, uh, Chinese society, began uh, in the 4th and 3rd centuries BCE and was finished uh, in 221 to 207, uh, co uh, coincident uh, with the first unification of China, the one we're talking about right now. Uh, so, uh, one way to kind of see this would be to say uh, that. This project was so vast, uh, with millions uh, of uh, people working on it, uh, you know, through the centuries, uh, forced to work on it, uh, subjects forced into these work camps, uh, that it shows you how much power the centralized, uh, you know, government had, how much this uh, power this new empire had, how much power, uh, you know, the first emperor and the others that follows, uh, uh, you know, wielded. Uh, you don't get a project done like that unless you have hierarchical uh, centralized authority. Uh, two things we've already talked about uh, and how they uh, join together, hierarchy uh, and centralization. This is a, uh, a tremendous example uh, of very successful hierarchy and very successful centralization of power. The Terracotta Army, uh, it's just it's astonishing. I think it's 10,000 or somewhere in there. Uh, of uh, terracotta uh, soldiers that were put in the tomb uh, of Shi, Shi Huangdi, uh, uh, along with all kinds of other valuables. Our text uh, gives you a few more tidbits on that uh, uh, as well. What does this tell us? Uh, this dude had power and started to build a big, beautiful wall. Sorry, I couldn't resist. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I won't even get into that. Uh, but... Uh, but the army itself, I mean, these are like clay, basically, uh, figurines, like toy soldiers, although like life-sized, and they take up today what's sort of a huge uh, building, like, a, like an airplane hangar, uh, and uh, uh, this was all put in the tomb uh, of the first emperor. So the idea, uh, apparently, uh, was that these uh, soldiers were to protect him, you know, uh, after, after death. Uh, and a lot of the other things put in the tomb uh, were to console uh, him and give him, uh, you know, a uh, way of life similar to the one he had uh, uh, in uh, this world. Fortunately for Chinese centralized power, uh, if you're a fan of that, if you were a fan of it, if you lived there, some were, some weren't, uh, but uh, a 
military strongman named Liu Bang uh, quickly kind of put uh, uh, centralized power back together again after uh, the death of the first emperor because uh, there were revolts and rebellions and it looked like uh, China might break up after you know, one uh, uh, you know, one person's reign. Uh, but uh, Liu Bang uh, uh, from the Han uh, uh, territory, uh, a uh, n not really an aristocratic figure. Uh, he was sort of known to be rather coarse and uh, 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 not too refined, uh, kind of a brute, uh, uh, a ruffian, a big drinker. Uh, but uh, he uh, was a good soldier, uh, not so much brilliant, uh, but uh, he uh, was a good organizer. Uh, sort of, uh, he uh, was a hard worker. Uh, he brought on gifted advisors, uh, got tremendous loyalty from his troops, uh, and through uh, all those things, uh, offered uh, leadership in a way that uh, either kept or brought centralized power uh, back uh, together, depending on how you look at it. Uh, professors Bentley and Ziegler, again, both quotes here uh, are for, uh, for passages. Uh, in the same part of the book, near each other, the Han Dynasty turned out to be one of the longest and most influential in all of Chinese history. It lasted for more than 400 years. The Han Dynasty consolidated the tradition of centralized imperial rule that the Qin Dynasty has uh, had pioneered. During the early Han, emperors ruled from uh, uh, Chang'an, a cosmopolitan city, uh, contemporaries described uh, it as a thriving metropolis with a fine imperial palace, busy markets, and expansive parks. So uh, urban civilization was already thriving uh, in uh, centralized China uh, and the beginnings of the Han Dynasty, the second uh, of the centralized uh, Chinese dynasties. Uh, they go on to say that during the early days of the dynasty, uh, Liu Bang attempted to follow a middle path between the decentralized network of political alliances of the Zhou dynasty on the tightly centralized state of the Qin. So one had tried to uh, rule uh, sort of in a decentralized uh, way, more of a feudal uh, uh, system, uh, just trying to avoid the chaos of the period of warring states, though it's difficult, uh, and in between the more tightly centralized top-down control uh, of the more recent Qin. Uh, Zhou Decentralization encouraged political cha political chaos, however, at least from uh, uh, Liu Bang's point of view. Uh, and uh, because uh, regional governors were powerful enough to resist the emperor and pursue their own ambitions, uh, Liu Bang uh, thought that uh, Qin centralization created a new set of problems. Uh, uh, so, uh, because it provided uh, little incentive for imperial family members to support the dynasty. So he's saying either way you go, uh, whether you uh, heavily centralize, uh, make it heavily top-down, or spread power out, uh, there are difficulties, just different ones. So he tried to cut it down the middle. On the one hand, he allotted large land holding to members of the imperial family uh, in the expectation that they would provide a reliable network for his rule. On the other hand, he divided the empire into administrative districts governed by officials who served at the emperor's pleasure in the expectation that he could exercise a, a effective control over the development and implementation of his policies. Uh, it's hard to say whether this worked or not, and certainly worked for a time, or at least survived for a time. There might have been other reasons uh, why uh, the you know kingdom... Uh, stayed centralized, you know, uh, under the control of the Han Dynasty for a long time. The Han, uh, with a couple of exceptions, basically ruled for about 400 years. So it was a very successful uh, uh, dynasty in Chinese history. But was it because, uh, or at least partly because this guy did sort of split the difference, uh, sort of walk that tightrope between centralized and decentralized? Well, hard, hard to know. The importance uh, of uh, the writings uh, of uh, uh, this uh, uh, gentleman here, uh, a fascinating figure, uh, uh, Sima Qian, uh, uh, an historian of all things, uh, actually was more of a uh, astrologer, uh, uh, at least uh, uh, for a while. He was known as the Grand Historian uh, at the 
uh, court uh, of one of the emperors uh, and uh, his primary job was to observe astronomical phenomena which basically means astrology look up into the heavens uh, look at the stars uh, and then uh, interpret what they mean like reading tea leaves or uh, you know going to a psychic or uh, whatever it might be uh, but this kind of stuff all over the world at the time was thought to you know have value in predicting the future uh, his father uh, had taken on the task at the same time of writing a history of the known world uh, which basically meant China uh, and places that China came into contact with so because the known world wasn't as known as it is today uh, but he didn't get too far in the project before he passed away uh, but before he uh, went he implored his son to carry on the project for him <coughs> excuse me uh, uh, the emperor uh, uh, was a very capable, energetic ruler uh, who had was known for uh, aggressive uh, and successful trade, uh, aggressive, successful foreign policy uh, projects, so uh, warfare, uh, economic uh, trade policies, he was quite successful at. Uh, but uh, after uh, Sima uh, defended a disgraced general on uh, the, the emperor's military the emperor uh, enraged uh, sentenced him sentenced him to death uh, but uh, actually in the end commuted the sentence to castration I don't know if you know what castration is uh, but it's kind of falls under the category of ouch uh, and uh, castration was uh, humiliating I guess that's not surprising but it was extra humiliating so uh, some people uh, believe it or not, when faced with the choice of you, you can either be castrated or be executed, they would choose to be executed because it was uh, too humiliating. Uh, but because this guy had promised his father that he would finish his uh, history of China, or the known world, mostly China, uh, he uh, agreed to be castrated and was, which made him a eunuch. Uh, and eunuchs are famous in Chinese history. We'll see uh, later in the class, in the last month, uh, because uh, eunuchs as a whole, as a group, became important advisors uh, to kings. We've actually already seen it uh, uh, in other places. Uh, remember that a eunuch, uh, since he doesn't have his uh, uh, generative or regenerative material any longer, uh, uh, he can't be, his family can't be a threat. There can't be a dynastic threat because he can't have a family. Uh, though that wasn't the reason uh, that uh, uh, Sima Khan uh, was uh, castrated. Uh, nonetheless, he finished the project, uh, and uh, uh, it's a, a gigantic uh, a history uh, that mainly deals with lots of details and facts. It's not so much an interpretive history. There's some of that in there, too. In a famous letter that he wrote, uh, he said, The reason I have not refused to bear these ills, meaning... Uh, uh, castration and have continued to live uh, uh, d dwelling uh, among this filth is that I grieve that I have things in my heart that I have not been able to express fully and I'm ashamed to think that after I'm gone my writings will not be known to posterity meaning to the future to numerous too numerous to record are the men of ancient times who are rich and noble and whose names have yet vanished away so he's saying my work's too important uh, I'm having, trying to bring people that deserve to be remembered kind of back to, uh, to life in a sense by putting their deeds, uh, their actions, their lives on paper. Uh, and uh, I can't go, uh, uh, you know, until I do that. So he agreed to be castrated instead of executed. Uh, that wouldn't be a great choice. Uh, the martial emperor, uh, right, uh, this is the emperor Wu, Wu that uh, uh, Sima was having to deal with. Uh, Han Wudi, sometimes referred to as the martial emperor, which means the warlike uh, or warring emperor. Uh, so, uh, and a lot of what we know about him uh, comes uh, from uh, the writings uh, of the historian we just mentioned. Uh, so, uh, you can see uh, that uh, quite a bit of information uh, uh, was included uh, in that book. Uh, it recorded uh, things about other peoples, the nomads who were constantly 
uh, a thorn in, in uh, Chinese Empire side, the barbarians, the Chinese called them, who were more than one uh, group, uh, though at this time they were united, uh, or a lot of them were united sort of into one uh, whole, uh, uh, which made them much more difficult to deal with uh, than they already were. Uh, they lived just outside the empire. Uh, the emperor here, Han Wudi, uh, made Confucianism the official and individual code of conduct and the centerpiece of educational curriculum. Uh, and this uh, uh, has resonance going down through the centuries as well, as we'll see. Uh, the reliance of the government on uh, an elite, uh, highly educated civil service uh, from uh, Confucius's uh, uh, thinking and system, well-schooled in Confucian writings and other classics, uh, remained the educational norm for centuries. Uh, and that means that eventually it was the norm not just for civil servants that were training for government service, but for anyone uh, that was lucky enough or well-connected enough to receive an education. With Wu as emperor, uh, China reconquered much territory, or conquered and reconquered much territory, uh, uh, first taken uh, by uh, Qin Shui Hang Di, uh, particularly in southern China uh, and northern Vietnam. So there were conquests and reconquests, hence uh, the martial emperor, uh, as Han Wu Di uh, is often uh, called. So that Confucian educational system uh, established by Han Wu Di uh, was mainly there at the time to prepare uh, elite uh, men uh, for government service, uh, educate them uh, extremely well. Uh, and as uh, McClellan again says in Science and Technology in World History, the power and appeal of the imperial bureaucracy drained talent that might have flowed into science. The bureaucracy skewed scholarship toward the humanities and the Confu and Confucian classics, and it helped enforce a huge divide between learned culture and the crafts. Uh, already in Han times, Chinese officials instituted the system of state examinations, which began the centuries-long process of the state recruiting functionaries not through political or hereditary connections, but rather based on ability and performance on exacting civil service exams, which are primarily based on a Confucian education. So a couple things here of importance. China, as far as I know, was way ahead of anyone else in the world in figuring out uh, that, hey, if you want to have effective government, why don't you have make sure you have well-educated, well-trained uh, uh, people working in government, in administration, uh, and other capacities, uh, and uh, make them compete uh, through a, 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 a system of competitive examinations, so civil service exams uh, uh, to bring in people based on their ability and merit, uh, and not just because of uh, you know who their father was. Uh, the Chinese were way ahead of Europe. Europe doesn't do this until centuries later. So this is a remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, 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 China stands uh, head and shoulders above everybody else with regard to. Uh, it's also, I think, interesting to point out that Confucius, because remember, uh, the, the main uh, educational sources, uh, texts that he thought were uh, of the greatest value, uh, were the Book of Songs uh, and the other uh, four books uh, going back to uh, you know earlier times in China, which means then that the, the primary education, more or less the equivalent of a college degree for uh, budding Chinese bureaucrats, uh, administrators, civil servants, was a literary education. Remember, the Book of Songs is mostly poems. So how could poems uh, or literature be uh, seen as, or even actually be, good training uh, for political leadership? I would argue that it actually was and is, and this happens in other places too later, uh, but also it shows up in uh, Europe and England more specifically, where the upper classes there that go to Oxford and Cambridge, many of whom go into uh, government service, rise high uh, in its ranks, uh, their education was in the classics. By that time, it was the Greek and Roman uh, uh, classics uh, uh, for the most part. But think about it. There were no social sciences in those days. So now we'd, you'd study, uh, you know, political science or the law or economics uh, or, or something like that if you're going to go into government service I mean you could major in anything but those would be the more likely choices but since there were no social sciences uh, what you 
would want to know is how to deal with people, uh, right? Uh, both individuals and how to deal with uh, people uh, in institutions, and you can learn uh, that uh, uh, where through uh, literature. So uh, not then a surprise, although it at first sounds like one, uh, that the primary education that Confucius uh, established, and he established it, it lasted for centuries this way, uh, was uh, a literary, uh, one could say, uh, uh, humanistic one, humanities. Uh, Han, uh, his warfare uh, included uh, his uh, uh, responsibilities uh, and conquests, uh, right? Included defense, not just offense. Uh, and this is uh, where uh, the uh, nomads from the steppes outside of China, but the wall was uh, built uh, primarily uh, uh, to deal with, uh, comes into play. Uh, the the Xiang Nu. Uh, were a sort of group uh, that had rallied other nomads sort of under their banner and united them, at least for a time, making them uh, a force. So the Chinese Empire uh, versus a vast confederation of nomadic peoples uh, under the uh, Xiongnu, uh, and this in some ways represents what we call conventional versus asymmetrical or guerrilla warfare. Uh, so the Chinese armies were not used to fighting uh, uh, this type of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, military system uh, and against this kind of uh, tactics. Uh, they just hadn't uh, had to do it before, and they didn't adjust to it well, partly because it's not easy to adjust to at all. Uh, so the Xiong Nu uh, uh, were uh, very worthy opponents. Uh, as Barry Cunliffe, uh, in a book called By Step, Desert, and Ocean, uh, tells us, uh, early efforts by a unified China to turn back nomads, particularly the uh, Xiongnu, failed. Instead of intimidating the nomads, uh, it set off a political uh, revolution on, on the steppes. Uh, and, um, sorry, one second, I have to take a sip. That's better. Forgive me. Uh, so, uh, rather, uh, steps using the feuding uh, uh, Xiongnu tribes into the world's first true nomad empire. Rather than taxing peasants to pay off uh, a mounted aristocracy, uh, the Xiongnu uh, overlord uh, Mao Dun uh, founded his ultra low end, ultra low end state entirely by plundering China and buying the loyalty of lesser nomad chiefs with captured silk and wine. An ultra low-end state means that uh, they don't have a lot of costs uh, because they don't really have a bureaucracy. They don't have a capital. They're roaming around on horseback uh, and their economy is plunder, uh, raiding and stealing it from other people. So low-end state means it's sort of relatively simple and low cost, low maintenance, uh, and they just sort of steal and then uh, they use some of that to buy off other people. Uh, to be on their side. Uh, the second Chinese emperor, uh, Gaudi, led a huge army into the steppe uh, only uh, to learn that fighting nomads was different than fighting rivals for China's throne. Uh, the uh, Xiong Nu uh, nomads uh, 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 fell back uh, on purpose, letting the Chinese starve in the wilderness uh, and then turned uh, back uh, and sprang an ambush on the Chinese. And it's this kind of thing that you know resembles guerrilla tactics that Chinese uh, conventional forces weren't used to facing. From there, different methods to deal with the nomads were tried, such as intermarriage. Uh, the emperor actually forced one of his daughters uh, to marry uh, the uh, uh, Xiongnu leader. Uh, she had to go live off in the desert and you know away from Chinese civilization. Uh, there was all kinds of uh, cultural artifacts, songs, and uh, stories about uh, the poor princess that had to go sort of live with the barbarians as the Chinese saw them. The northern border uh, with the nomads, uh, continuing uh, Conliffe's uh, quote here, continued to be a problem. Already in the late Han, it had become policy to settle nomad groups within the Great Wall. Uh, this relieved pressure on the frontier and provided a buffer against raids from the north. So another strategy uh, tried. 
short of warfare. Uh, but the settlers themselves posed a threat. They were constantly warring amongst themselves and were prone to call in allies from among the free nomads to the north, those outside of the wall. It remained an unstable arrangement. One contemporary writer gave a succinct analysis of the situation, saying that the success of the nomads who had settled within the frontier was due less to their natural vigor and more to the skills they had learned from the Chinese in organization, warfare, and production. So this strategy uh, didn't necessarily work either, in part, as it's saying there at the end, because uh, once the selected groups that were brought into the uh, kingdom uh, within the confines of the walls started to learn Chinese ways, Chinese customs, Chinese technology, uh, and it benefited them uh, uh, if and when uh, the, the two ever uh, sort of turned against each other again, or if the knowledge uh, uh, was diffused back out to, you know, outside the walls, as it often was. Economy, society, and culture in the early Han Dynasty. Uh, there was slavery in China, though a fairly small amount. Uh, bureaucrats, those well-trained Confucian-educated ones we talked about, uh, were at the top of the social pyramid. Uh, then you had the, kind of a landlord class, followed by peasants. Merchants, again, beneath them. So this is something that's now lasted for quite some time. Merchants aren't uh, uh, anywhere near the top of the hierarchy. Uh, Confucianism's uh, uh, five relationships organized power, uh, a part of which uh, was, uh, and this is a continuation uh, of uh, previous eras, but an extremely patriarchal society uh, where women were expected to defer uh, to all. So Confucius certainly uh, uh, had that in his philosophy. I didn't mention it uh, earlier, but it is consistent with uh, earlier Chinese history. Uh, one, I think, can rightly say that Confucius's philosophy overall uh, was very conservative. And I don't mean that as a, 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 a judgment, good or bad, in any way. Uh, uh, there are things conservative that I think uh, work, uh, and some that uh, uh, don't work so well in any society then and now. Uh, but uh, uh, nonetheless, Confucian, uh, for, you know, for better or worse, Confucius' philosophy uh, was a fairly conservative one. So knowing that, it shouldn't surprise us uh, that he uh, continued to sort of view uh, women's subordination uh, as part of the uh, you know, accepted uh, and uh, natural fabric of society. Uh, there was a little bit of social mobility through education, uh, uh, a little bit, but it was mainly still the uh, rich uh, elite families that sent their uh, young sons to you know, study uh, the uh, Confucian uh, uh, classics and educational uh, system. Uh, filial, pi uh, filial piety is another example, respect for elders and religion, uh, sort of centering around elders. Elders, another example of Confucius's conservative philosophy. Conservative in the sense that he's trying to maintain traditions that he believes are crucial to stability and harmony. Um, legalism, we've already talked about. Uh, peasant rebellion started to rise uh, as the Han, uh, Han dynasty started to uh, uh, you know, uh, decline in power. But they, of course, had something to do with that decline at the same time. This brings us to the chaotic reign, reign of Wang Mang, uh, who uh, basically was a rebel leader uh, of some uh, ability. Uh, and uh, his revolts uh, didn't entirely uh, uh, succeed, uh, but they were in, in many ways virtually the last straw uh, for the power of the Han Dynasty, uh, which did make a comeback. Uh, so there's a, an early Han and a later Han, and we're not going to get into those uh, details. It's it's quite complex. Uh, we don't uh, uh, need to get that complex. Uh, but uh, it's fair enough to say, as the slide here does, that uh, Wang Mang uh, overthrew the Han, uh, even though that's not 100% true. Part of this process included something known as the Yellow Turban Uprising, uh, right? Uh, so uh, there were a number of uprisings. The Yellow Turban uh, Uprising, named after the uh, garments uh, that the rebels uh, wore in this case. Uh, so... Uh, this uh, had a, a lot to do uh, with uh, the peasantry uh, uh, being uh, squeezed in many ways. Uh, peasant rebellions break out. Uh, 
this is kind of like the last days of Rome in, in, in some ways. Uh, so uh, all kinds of things going on uh, in terms of class conflict here. Uh, Stavrianos, uh, one of the authors I've been relying on, says the taxpaying peasantry began to be squeezed out on the downward spiral once more was underway. Great rebellions broke out, and the situation resembled that of the last days of Rome. Uh, the decimation of the small peasants had also destroyed the original peasant draft army. This was replaced by professional troops, whose first loyalty was to their generals, which isn't a good thing for a state. We'll see the same thing happens in ancient Rome as well. Another uh, similarity between the Han and the Romans. The generals, therefore, could ignore the central government, just like in Rome. Great landowners also defied the government by evading taxes and enlarging their holdings by various legal and extra-legal means. Helpless peasants fleeing the barbarian invaders or government tax collectors became the virtual serfs of these landowners in return for economic and physical security. Uh, the great families converted their manors into fortresses, virtually taking over the functions of government in their respective localities. What all this means is that centralized power is breaking down once again uh, and becoming decentralized uh, with local lords becoming leaders now, kind of rulers of little small breakaway kingdoms. Their estates were largely self-sufficient so that trade declined and cities shrank correspondingly. It certainly hurt than the overall Chinese economy as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, having many other, or causing many other difficulties. In 221 CE, the Han Dynasty disappeared from the stage of history in a swirl of peasant revolts, warlord coups, and nomadic raids. China then entered a period of prolonged, uh, a period of disunity uh, and disorder. Uh, and we see, uh, again, the Yellow Turban Uprising is just one of the uh, many uh, elements of class conflict during this very tumultuous period. Thank you.